Boa noite, pessoal. Estamos aqui para mais uma sessão da Horror Expo Live 2020, na presença do nosso convidado de honra, Dacri Stoker, e nos comentários, Lord A, nosso querido especialista em vampiros aqui no Brasil. Good night, Dacri. This is an, really an honor to receive you here with us in this event. It's, it's my honor to be here at the Horror Expo again. I, I've always felt a good kindred spirit with, with my fans and friends in Brazil. So, uh, Great to be here. Good luck with uh, running a wonderful event. I'm happy to be a part of it. Thank you. For us, it's really, really special to have you here. And we are big fans of your work with Dracul. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I have another favorite, Dracula, then Daddy. I hope this becomes a move it's very, very soon. Do you want to get... The questions for Dacre? Oh, that? yeah, I have, I have some questions for my noble friend, Professor Dr. Stoker. Good evening, Professor. How are you? Andreas, I'm very well, thank you. Happy Halloween to you. And we say in Ireland, slanche to you. <laughs> Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween, my friend. And I have some questions here for you. And let, let's go. Most of the biographical works on Br Bram Stoker focus on his as the author of Dracula. For example, those of Barbara Belfort and David Scott, while his later works are sometimes just mentioned. Dracula, it's fantastic, but the jewel of seven stars and the lad of the white worm are magnificent books too. Is there significant less preparatory material related to these books available for analysis? Or is this material just negligent by the searchers. Well, Andreas, I've been looking for 15 years into all the places around the world and the museums, the archives, mm -hmm. the different holdings, both public and private. And mm -hmm. the short part, and I, I will elaborate once our translator takes over, is we have not found notes for Jewel of Seven Stars or Layer of the White Worm. We haven't found any of the contracts. We haven't found the type scripts. So it is a mystery still where some of these other things are. So if you'd like to translate, then I will pick up afterwards. No. Don't worry, Dick. I will put subtitles later. Oh, okay. So I just keep yeah, going. Caesar. Yeah, yeah, it's Caesar. Okay. Okay, let me keep going. So All right. mm -hmm. what 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 we know Andreas, about Jewel of the Seven Stars and Layer of the White Worm and, and many other books, is when Bram Stoker died in 1912, his wife sold a number of his, of his library because when he died, she didn't have very much money. Uh, he didn't have a big, any pension from his job at the Lyceum Theater, no inheritance. So she had to sell his library. And some of the things she sold that are now gone were some of these works that were as preparatory notes for Layer of the White Worm, other books as well. But I will say this. Someday somebody will find them and we'll be able to complete the story. Layer of the White Worm was the last thing Bram Stoker ever wrote. And mm -hmm. it's to me, there's a melodrama to this because he had had a stroke His, his body wasn't functioning very well, but he was trying his best to tell a very straight from the heart Irish tale. And it does deserve mention because it has been popularized and turned into a movie. Jewel of Seven Stars was actually the original inspiration for the movie, The Mummy. So both of these are credible works, as you point out, but we just don't have much information or study like we have Drac Dracula. Mm -hmm. oh, There is another question here. Is one of the great recent discoveries in Stoker studies is Dracula's Icelandic version, is Mac Mikana, Powers of Darkness. Oh, And it creates darkness. the possibility of a social reading of Dracula. Do you think Power of Darkness is something like a first version or Is a, a special edition? Well, li listen, I, I actually wrote the introduction for the English version of this. My friend, 
a Dutch guy, Hans de Roos, was the one mm -hmm. that discovered this. He was looking at the preface for this that was discovered in 1989 by Richard Dalby. And it's a very different preface than the original Dracula. It okay. tells that this story is real. And Richard Dalby never looked at the rest of the book. Hans de Roos took pieces of the book and, mm -hmm. and put it on Google Translate. And he goes, <laughs> and he called me, Dacre. Wow. This is, a, this is a different story. What's going on? Is there a manuscript? Do we have a contract? What's, what's in the Stoker archives? And I said, no contract, no archives. So he had the whole thing translated from Icelandic back to English. And we found that the story was very different. And Hans did incredibly strong research about Vladimir Osmundson, who was the translator and the publisher and found out that he was an author and my theory is, this is an early version of Dracula that Osmundson has taken some liberties with and changed it. So it was published. But then the story gets better because it was published, I think, in 2017 or 18. And a guy in Sweden, Rickard Burkhorn, sent us an email and saying, hey, guys, this same story appeared in Sweden a year before it turned up in Iceland, in, in the newspaper, because it was a rule in, in Sweden and Iceland and many other countries, America included, that if you want, if you're a foreign author, you have to have the book serialized in a newspaper for free before you could publish it in a book. So Burkhorn wow. found this story, Matper Kraner, Powers of Darkness in Sweden, and we hypothesize that the newspapers from Sweden get sent over to Iceland. And Rick and um, Osmundson found the newspapers, put the same story in the Icelandic newspaper, and then published it in 1901 with some changes because not all the newspapers made their way to Iceland. They were lost. So mm -hmm. the Icelandic version that de Roos turned into English is three quarters of the story. The Swedish version is being translated now into English and will be out in 2021, the full version. It is more sexual. It is more violent. There is human sacrifice in the bottom of Castle Dracula with half person, half ape-like bodies. And there are corrupt politicians who Dracula has his power over. So that's what we have to look forward to in 2021 is the rest of the story. It's incredible. And I think that Bram Stoker presented this version of his story to his British publisher. And he said, too scary, too, sc too sexy, change it. That's wow. why we ended up with the wow. way we have. That's an amazing story. That's an amazing story, my noble friend. Power of Darkness, it's like um, it's like a cut version sometimes, I think. I love it. I love this idea. Dr. Bakery, we have one more question here. Following the previous question, we know Stalker's opinion on Gladstone. At the same time, his political views are not clear, explicit in his work. Could you comment a little as manager of the Bram Stoker state on Bram Stoker political opinion, political opinion? Aristocratic villains are in constant in his work. Yeah, aristocratic villains are always the best villains. I, I agree with this. And in, the, in Bram Stoker work, but what is what he really told about the aristocracy? Or is more about following the models established by published by the preceding Gothic novels. Well, you see, you've asked a very deep probing question, and I've got to give some context. Bram Stoker was a Protestant Irishman who left Ireland, which was predominantly Catholic. And he was a very sensitive man and he was very aware. And I believe he was concerned about religious conflict. In Ireland, religion 
and politics go hand in hand as far as conflict goes, okay, for many hundreds of years. He leaves and comes to England, who, as you very well know, has conflict between Ireland and England. Mm. But he was a man that had a very important job, and that was to be the theater manager for Henry Irving. And that is, in English, we call it, it is escapism. The last thing in the world he wanted to do was to become a politically identified figure in London and be identified as a renegade or as somebody espousing, even though he believed in Irish home rule, he, he was in no position to be a, a, a political activist because he was in the position of being a theater manager, which is mm -hmm. escapism, which is entertainment, which is non-controversial. So I believe he kept his political feelings out of his literature, out of his life. But he did, as you just said, Andreas, he, he slowly inserted these into his writing because you can see, and many people have commented on this as well, that Count Dracula was an aristocrat and he was sort of pushing down on Jonathan Harker, who was a middle-class working man. Arthur mm -hmm. Holmwood is an upwards guy, and he was the money guy. Same with Quincy Morris, American, but he came in with all the money. So there is mm -hmm. class struggle that is somewhat identified in the story, but it's, it's kind of under the level. It's not overt, and it's, it's primarily because Bram wanted to sell books, and he wanted to entertain people without troubling them with the worries of the world of politics. He wanted people to escape. And you know, when we escape, and you can be horrified <laughs> by a mm -hmm. vampire story or something, it's actually a healthy escape because you get away of the real problems of the world. And if you don't like it, you close the book. Or you, or you go out of the theater at night and you go home to the comfort of your house. So this is, this is really my my statement on why Bram Stoker, he was a true and true Irishman all his life and he felt strong about Ireland and he did have a friendship with Gladstone, but it's because mm -hmm. he really knew his position. He had to take care of it. And Dacre, which authors do you think have had more influence in Bram's work? Ah, uh, yes. Listen, Ireland is a, a, a country of storytellers. I am convinced Joseph Sheridan Le Fanu was an influence on him. Um, possibly even the other writer, John Polidari, who wrote The Vampire, and J. Malkin, Malkin mm -hmm. Reimer, who wrote Varney the Vampire, um, Edgar Allan Poe, Mary Shelley. These are two people that his mother, Bram's mother, actually wrote in a letter to Bram and said, I'm sure your story is wonderful. It is even more spectacular, more sensational than Shelley's Frankenstein. Edgar Allan Poe is nothing compared to you. So those were the two big, um, you know, the sort of the gods of, of horror stories, of gothic stories that mm. I, I think, I think it influenced Bram, but he never said this. He never wrote anything that said, I was influenced by, by this. He never actually mm. wrote an autobiography. So everything I say about Bram is what I get from my research. And I am somewhat skeptical about some of the biographers who mm -hmm. I think do a little more, too much speculation without evidence. Of course, of course. Of course There's an, another question here about Florence Stoker and the legacy of, of her uh, husband. Yeah. How do you think she was in charge of the changes in Dracula's core when the work was adapted to the theater and cinema? Well, I know, I know what it is. <laughs> First of all, mm. Bram Stoker was very smart. He protected the dramatic rights of Dracula by having a reading on the stage, which was the law in England by the Lord Chamberlain's office for copyright. So mm. eight days before May 26, when Dracula was published, Bram did a very smart thing. It was boring, just a staged reading in the Lyceum Theater. This was like sending a check to your wife 
for inheritance after you die because he died in 1912. In 1922, Nosferatu comes out and she starts a copyright infringement legal case through the British Writers Society and prevails. But there's no money because Prana Films is bankrupt. Then two years later, she starts working with one writer to create the first stage adaptation of Dracula. And it's a disaster because she tried to fit the whole book with all the changes, which is written in the epistolary style. So you have every different Mina's journal, Jonathan Harker's journal, Van Helsing's perspective, everybody's perspective. And, and it was a disaster. Charles Morell was the writer. She finally had the sense to go to the Irish writer, Hamilton Dean. And he said, let me do it. I'll take care of this. And she trusted him because he was a fellow Irishman. And he adapted Dracula and it became a big hit in 1924. And after 1924, it picked up momentum. And John Balderston from America contacted Hamilton Dean and they brought the play and they adapted it even more to America when Bela Lugosi starred on stage in 1927. But Florence Stoker still owned part of the rights. So she was getting a good amount of money from this. And then when Universal Studios went to Dean and Balderston and Mrs. Stoker and said, we'd like to buy the movie rights, they sold them and did very well. So mm. at the beginning, she was, she was tough and wanted it her way. And then she realized she would, did not have the expertise to do it right. And these other guys did it and made her a lot of money. And the rest is history and it's beautiful. <laughs> well, yeah, it, it is history. But I, I like to say this this time of the year. The Stoker family owes a lot to Bram's being smart to protect the copyright. Florence's yeah. tenacity and strength to force the British Writers Society to do the lawsuit against Nosferatu because it mm -hmm. was the first copyright infringement from book to movie. And as a fellow artist, and, and all of us on this call are all artists, we don't like our work to be knocked off and stolen. Mm -hmm. Nosferatu is a wonderful movie, and I'm glad that they did keep one copy, even though they weren't supposed to. But it's okay, because Mrs. Stoker didn't suffer financially. But the precedent was set legally to have a copyright infringement challenge in court between the author's family and the maker of the film. Now they have to do the rights properly. So it's, it's a good, happy story. And the Lugosi family, mm -hmm. who I'm now a, a lot in touch with, even though it was a very different Dracula, mm -hmm. it wasn't the same appearance of Bram Stoker's Dracula. He was not an, a, an attractive man like Bela was. Bela needed to be a changed Dracula to represent the handsome man on stage that the British audience were used to seeing, and the same with the American. So it was a transformation that maybe Mrs. Stoker didn't plan herself, but it worked out well in the long run that both of these men, Bela Lugosi and Bram Stoker, owe a lot to each other. They're even greater in their death than they were in their life. Mm -hmm. There is another interesting question here is, why do you think Bram resorted to the tradition of the Gothic novel? Well, the, the, I mean, the Gothic was had only been started really with the Castle uh -huh. of Oronto, early 1800s, and then Frankenstein. Uh -huh. it, was the, it was the perfect theme for somebody coming out of Ireland. It was, you know, the, the, the super, the, the, it was a supernatural, but it was suggestive of supernatural. And Ireland has an incredible history of an understanding of the spiritual world. I mean, this weekend is Samhain in Ireland, Sawi, which is the change of the seasons from the light time of the year to the dark time of the year, when the evil spirits come out and the, and the good spirits come out. And, and we, they would put on costumes to scare away the evil and give candies and treats to welcome the good spirits, that bonfires to welcome. So the spiritual world 
and the supernatural was a very natural thing for Bram Stoker. He was brought up in this. He, he, he was part of his, you know, his being. So for him yeah. to start off now, he didn't he didn't start off writing Gothic, but he realized this was something special when he wrote Dracula starting in 1890. Um, and it was the, the perfect mix. It was something that the English speaking world needed, especially since he's bringing something from a foreign land, which is a Gothic theme, a foreign land into the center of the universe, which was London at the time. And it was disrupting the Victorian ways, which was very comfortable, no big changes. They didn't like things to change. And yet Bram Stoker brought in this story in real time that mm -hmm. pushed upon them something like supernatural. So it was just the perfect mix to have the supernatural shoved into London, England in 1897. I have a what? question. That mm -hmm. is Sir Henry Irving is considered by is considered by some people here um, maybe a kind of model for the Count Dracula, sometimes inspiration. But I read a, a, a curious passage in an old old book that one night Bram Stoker had a dinner with the husband of a great diva from Paris theater. And when he sees this man, his man, he is a great problem with opium. When Bram Stoker look at him during the dinner, Bram Stoker have some strange feelings and, and, and had right in some place. Oh man, this, this man is the perfect image for um, for a uh, dead, for someone who he rises from the dead. He is strange. He is failing. His walks like like um, uh, haunting. Uh, well, did you know? But but this is uh, the husband of a great diva from the Paris theaters, and Sir Henry even it's called of a magnetic people of someone who the peoples look at him and be stared. He someone someone's right. He hypnotized the people and use a long black cape. Is any true on these relates or just uh, speculation from Dracula lovers? You know, Andreas, if Bram Stoker ever left us his autobiography, you and I and, and Victor wouldn't be asking these questions now. 123 years later, we wow. are still asking questions. And this is what makes this book so incredible, is that... I we want to, we, we are, if this book has had such an impact on literature and popular culture that we need, we have this feeling, we want the answers. Now, I have heard versions of this. I have heard so many versions of what inspired Bram Stoker. His son even said in a bit of a joke, he had a bad dream from eating dressed crab to a biographer. And the family knows that this is a bit of a joke but the biographer wrote it like it was real. Wow. So everybody likes to eat dressed crab thinking they will write the most famous novel in English in Gothic literature again. We know that Bram Stoker looked at two books, one in the Whitby Library, one in the London Library. I've seen the books. I've seen him underline things in the books and they wow. mention the devil. Vlad Dracula is the devil. We know... We know Bram Stoker watched Henry Irving play the, the play Faust, Mephistopheles, the devil. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we, know that, yeah. we know that all of these things and more, because when you work in the theater and you live in this wonderful fantasy world and you see different plays, you read books about Mammoth the Wanderer, you see Van der Kecken, which is the story of a, the lost souls traveling in the ocean. All of these things together, Andreas, I believe came together for Bram Stoker like this. It wasn't one or two or three. It was accumulation of things. It was an accumulation also of things in his childhood when he was a little boy. When his mother told him real stories of people being misdiagnosed and buried prematurely as a live person because of cholera. 
and they drag yeah. themselves out of the grave. We know the same things happens in parts of Europe because of the plague. People digging up bodies suspected of vampirism, but it's really contagious diseases. And they look like they're having blood come out of their mouth. So they stick a brick in their mouth and they put a stake in their heart. So he understood, and he's mentioned this in a few, in one, excuse me, newspaper article. So there is not one model, one exact thing that inspired my great grand uncle to write the story. It's many things. But the most important thing is he understood his audience. He was a theater manager. He knew what would scare the hell out of people. And so he understood Gothic literature. He understood London culture. But his research was pointing at a devil. Mm. And he, even if you look at Dracula in two places, as a bit of an Irishman's joke, the address that, Bram, that Count Dracula writes for the boxes of dirt to go to his house it's the house of Count de Ville, Count Devil. Mm. So that, that's, that's the cumulative effect, is he's a little yeah. bit funny with it, but it's everything together. That's true, that's true. And yeah. something amazing yeah. about yeah. Dracula is, sorry, Andres, this book has everything together because you have romance, you have horror, you have a thriller, you have everything inside one History. story. And yeah. Yeah, yeah. And It works forever. <laughs> well, it, like Dracula, it is, it's immortal. You're right. It's proven to be a book, and that's what classic books are like. Frankenstein is the same. In Frankenstein, we're now looking at what is what is their thinking of morality and science at the time of Frankenstein to create life, religion. It's all thrown in. Dracula, we look at. It's like you're looking through a looking glass of. Victorian society between 1890 and 1897. During those years, the English society who think they're on top of the world, they're still struggling from understanding Charles Darwin and the, the um, origin of the species. This is pitting religion versus science. Boom, 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 like this. And in this article, Bram reads, Charles Darwin says, oh yes, in South America, I find the vampire bat yeah. this is in an article that in chile that this is bram stoker read this article in the new york world newspaper so what does he do he takes those words from charles darwin and shoves them into the mouth of quincy morris when van helsing is saying oh yes there's this vampire and it's supernatural morris says oh but when i was in south america on my hunting trips these big vampire bats came out of the trees and drank the blood from my horse i had to shoot her So he connects the natural world with the supernatural world. It's incredible, uh, Victor, what you say. It's absolutely true. It's everything here. And it scared the hell out of people in London for many years. It's one of my favorite and one of the most amazing works. It's a great, it's a great, great classical. And in a classical, that kind of book that we go Not to discover the end of story, but to discover us in in what which part of our life we are, what which character of that book we are being on that moment on our life, and we read we read Dracula when we have 13 years, 40 years we read Dracula with 30, we read Dracula after 40, and always amazing, you always discover something, you always find something, you always with internet, you always meet new new researchers, new ideas, new vision. And Dracula is still alive. Dracula is our dark classical from all times, my noble friend. I, I have met many people, Andreas, that feel the same way. They read Dracula every two or three years and they find something else. It is a very complex story. As Victor said, it's romance, it's thriller, it's history. It's also a feminist novel because it's very much like Mina's story. You, you see this incredible modern woman taking charge in the last half of the book while she is still being a victim and turned into a vampire. No, it's, it's, it's a very, it's like an onion. 
you know the the vegetable onion you yeah, take yeah, off yeah, a layer yeah. you yeah. it's more and more and more That's and true. more mm -hmm. there we go it's amazing mm -hmm. it's amazing book peter what about the future of dracula daycare what can you well, tell I'll, us I'll, of future I'll projects I, i'll tell you what i'm doing with it and and um it's it's quite interesting for me because it's again like the onion i am working on turning some of Bram Stoker's stories into graphic novels. Wow. I, am, I am turning the story that Bram Stoker's mother told him, as I said, about premature uh, misdiagnosis, premature burial in 1838. This is the story. We have a record that she gave it to him written down. That's going into a graphic novel. So that's, that's one of my next projects. I have a, a publisher and an artist and a graphic novelist, we're a team, they'll be out in 2021. I'm also working on a film documentary. Um, I think Andreas saw the trailer for my yeah. search for the Castle Dracula. So I have one episode finished now and I, I need to do another one in Dublin, Ireland, Whitby, Cruden Bay, Scotland, and go back to Transylvania to do another one from the beginning of the novel. And so obviously we need funding and we need to do more work. So it, it really doesn't end. I have a, a short story coming out in a magazine called Weird Tales, November 11th, the last, the last days it's called. It's, it's the last week of Bram Stoker's life. And he knows he's gonna die. And there are certain secrets he needs to tell his wife and his son that he doesn't wanna take to the grave. And some of these secrets are where did the first 101 pages of Dracula go? How did Renfield become the mental patient? So it's these secrets that I have some information from that is in the short story. So I'm still having fun with it. And I still have one other story to write. I mean, maybe more, but I want to tell the story in a graphic novel, because I think that's the right way to do it, of Bram Stoker how he's writing Dracula as it happens. Wow. You know, what, what's going on in his head as a boy? What's he envisioning? Mm -hmm. What trauma? How that turns into the story? Because I've seen some wonderful movies and I would love it to become a movie. J.R. Tolkien, there's a good movie about how he, in his life, got the ideas to write Lord of the Rings. Alfred Hitchcock, mm -hmm. how he wrote the story Psycho. And, and I think this, that's been an inspire, inspiration to me because as good as much fun as I have writing books, I know going to a larger audience, it's usually something like a series or streaming that gets out to the greater world. So those are the next projects in, in, in my world anyway. Wow. Okay, my friend, this will be amazing. It will be amazing. I'm fascinated for this new project, my novel friend. Whoa, man, it's so <laughs> get Oh, well, I'm speaking as, as, um, as um, man, this will be great. This will be amazing. All right. Listen, besides, once this pandemic is over, resuming my trips to take people to see this incredible country of Romania. It's too, it's too, it's too nice. We got to go, but we got to get rid of all this craziness first. So you guys, you guys take care. And look, thank you so much for your interest in me. And as you know, I have a lot of interest in you. So good luck with uh, the rest of your festival. Thank you, Dacre. It was an honor to receive you here with us. It was really special. Okay. Thank you. Safe, Thank you. safe Halloween to you guys. Okay. Happy Halloween, my old friend. Okay. Take Thank care. you. Yep. Good bye night. Bye.